Hi folks, it's Switchback. If you are too scared to go backpacking or you're afraid to camp, whether it's in a campground with your car right there or a hiking site, either known as wild camping or backpacking, this is the video for you. And if you are interested in camping, hiking, backpacking, be sure to subscribe for more content about getting out there safely and responsibly. Know that it is very common to be freaked out, especially if this is something that's new for you. And really the only way to overcome that is to just do it. Know that there's nothing in nature that will deliberately harm you, as long as you know your place. Most fear is really not based in logic, and really, again, the only way to overcome it is just to do the thing that scares us. There's nothing in this world that comes without risk, and that means whether you're driving, you're sitting on your couch all the time, or you're getting out into the wilderness. In order to grow as a person, you have to take a certain amount of risk and face your fears. And when you're in the planning phase of your trip, address your specific fears, and we're gonna get into those more later in the video, but look at where you're planning on going and think about the fears that you have associated with that particular locale. So what you're gonna be afraid of in the desert is not necessarily what you're gonna be afraid of if you're going up to a mountain lake. And this is where educating yourself can be so critical. Because if you know what to do if you see a bear and bears are what scare you, then you're gonna have a lot less fear about it. And in my own experience, the more experience you have with bears, the less scared of them you get. Starting conditions that feel more comfortable for you. So whether that's closer to town, further from town, more people, less people, whatever makes you feel more comfortable, roll with it. If you can avoid going alone the first time, go with other experienced campers who can kind of show you the ropes and help put your mind at ease. Going somewhere with cell reception in case of an emergency or even just for peace of mind can help. Take things to keep you distracted and your brain engaged. So things like reading material, games. You can download some movies or some podcasts, but I would recommend avoiding some true crime ones, which might just spark up all those fears. Think about what might make you feel safe and what's realistic and legal for where you're going. So whether that's a knife, pepper spray, something like that, make sure that it's allowed where you're going. A self-defense course, however, is going to be even better. Spend some time outdoors, if at all possible, before you go camping. And just get familiar with sitting out and listening and looking and watching the wildlife and getting to know what the sounds are. For example, a female fox or vixen or a mountain lion can sound like someone screaming when you're out in the wilderness. And I'm putting a couple of links down in the description below with examples of this because, of course, that can sound horrifying in the middle of the night. So can the sound of branches rubbing against each other. So this is where sitting and listening in the wind for the sounds can be very helpful. Joys of being in nature. Make sure that you're bringing with you the proper gear to keep you warm and sheltered. Try out your gear before you go to camp and even sleep outside at home if that's a possibility for you. Like, I don't have a house where that's a possibility, but a lot of people do, and if you can, it's a great option. No matter where you're going, again, whether it's a car campground or it's out in the backcountry, always know your exits because things can and do go awry. So knowing more than one exit strategy really is critical for your safety. When you get to camp, if there's one direction that's kind of scaring you, then you might want to position either the back or the front of your tent in that direction, whatever feels safer for you. If you don't want to look in that direction or if you want to be able to see in that direction, then roll with it. Explore the area where you're camping and that will help you keep you from getting turned around later as well. But that way you know, oh, okay, there's a creek over here. So when I hear this later or... Um, when, if you're in a campground, you want to know where the camp host is or where the bathroom is. And if you're in the back country, okay, this looks like a good place for doing my dishes or digging a cat hole. Your tent can give you a sense of security. So the inner mesh can keep out the critters and the bugs and the rain fly, assuming that you have a two layer tent, but even just the outer solid layer of it can be a nice visible barrier so you can't see things and let your mind go wild and um, I know I feel a little bit safer and more protected inside of a tent so if I I just have concerns about some animal sniffing me or something like that much less of a risk inside of a tent 
And speaking of animals coming to your tent, eat away from your tent and try to keep your whole site crumb clean as best you're able. And that includes fruit peels, pistachio shells, anything like that, even if it's something that's probably compostable, it's not native to where you're going and that will attract animals and it's not good for the animals to get things that are not native for them. As the day is changing to night, sit and pay attention in your campsite. So turn off all the distractions, turn off, you know, the podcast, the movie, the like put down any reading material and just sit and look and listen because you want to know if there's a screech that it's an owl and not a person that's coming after you <laughs> or just Getting to just getting to know those sounds and have an association of like, oh, that cracking stick is a deer walking over here. If you are going to build a fire in your campsite, be sure. Woo. <laughs> Speaking of sounds, <laughs> I think a branch just broke. <laughs> well, that was authentic, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you decide you're going to build a fire and you need to gather wood, be sure to do so before dark. That said, not building a fire can be really good for your night vision and it will make it a lot easier to see what's around you. And keep your headlamp in the red light mode, which will also preserve your night vision. You may feel safer going into your tent after dark, but I will tell you what, my favorite thing, my absolute favorite thing about camping away from town and away from light is the stars. The stars, when you're camping, whether it's in the backcountry or in some campground that's far away from anywhere, the stars are amazing. Unless, of course, it's cloudy, it's foggy. As you're getting ready for bed, put away any food away from your tent and lock up any valuables. Um, if you're car camping, you can do so in your car. You can take them into your tent with you, whatever works for you. Just don't take your food in there with you. Top off your water and get anything that you want to have accessible. So like, for example, I like to have my headlamp, my phone, and a personal locator beacon in the exact same spot every time at night so that when I'm groggy and I'm tired and if there's a weird noise that I want to check out or I need to go pee or whatever, I can just grab what I need. Don't have to wake up any more than I have to and go. Speaking of going pee, you might want to consider a pee jar. I don't do this, but some people do, but it keeps you from having to get out of your tent at night unless you're with six of your friends. But um, don't dump it in the vestibule because one, it attracts animals, so there's that. But two, the next person doesn't really want to set up their tent on your pee. Personally, I get a little grossed out when people talk about peeing in their vestibules, <laughs> but I know people do. But again, that can attract animals. So I have had deer in my campsite licking my urine where I had peed, so I'm glad I peed away from camp. Um, but these are the same ones that later came back and ate my tank top that I had drying. Earplugs might make you feel a little bit safer so that you don't hear what's around you or it might freak you out that you can't hear what's around you. I also highly recommend carrying a sleep mask. It sounds princessy but when the full moon is out and shining on your tent or if like there's a you know headlights coming into the campground or the bathroom light or um, even the morning sun, if you know, if it gets sunny at 5.30 in the morning and you really don't want to be up at 5.30 in the morning, you're going to be really happy you had a sleep mask. I'd like to get into some specific fears, and I've had a lot of these myself, so I really can relate, and I still deal with my own fear, but I still get out there. If you're scared of the dark, then carry a headlamp, get some decent lighting for your campsite, that can help a lot so that you can look around, but a headlamp is nice because it follows wherever you're looking. So if you are looking in the bushes, you know, or what have you, that's where the light is going as well. Make sure that if you get a rechargeable option that you have a way to recharge it. And if you don't, then that you have plenty of extra batteries for if it dies. You can even string up some lights around camp and even leave them on at night because it can really give you some peace of mind. Now, if you're right next to other people, I don't recommend putting lights where it's going to be bright in someone else's sight necessarily. But it again, it can be nice when you get up and you need to go pee 
to be able to see what's going on around you. Going back to a previous suggestion, sit outside and listen to what the sounds are out there. Everything, when you're in your tent, feels like it's probably a mountain lion, a bear, whatever the predator of your choice is, but it's probably really what I've heard is a deer, a mouse, an otter, or something else that's really not a major threat. If you're afraid of being alone, first try not to go alone if you can avoid it, but I also understand that that's not always a possibility. In my own experience, I find it incredibly empowering to be out there by myself and totally self-sufficient. Ease into it by getting outside on your own first, on day hikes, getting more isolated areas, kind of pushing your comfort zone a little bit, and then go into a campground that feels like whatever conditions are safest to you. So if it's, again, a more populated area, if it's more dispersed camping, if it's out on a backpacking trip, whatever feels most comfortable for you, start there. If you're hiking in a group, then make a plan as far as, you know, no person left behind. Either stick together the whole time, have plans to meet up at certain intervals. Some groups like to hike separately and then just meet up at camp. Discuss that all ahead of time and be honest, if you're afraid of being alone, it's okay to say, I'd really feel more comfortable going with a partner. But absolutely no trip leader should ever leave you on your own without your consent and should never leave you behind. The trip leader's responsibility is to make sure that everyone gets there and gets back safely. And whether it's a casual group of friends or what have you, there is some one who really should be designated as the trip leader and that's going to be the person that's going to book the permits or what have you but there has to be someone who is keeping everyone accountable in that regard if you're afraid of not having tech or not having cell reception you will get better reception at higher elevations usually facing towns and you can look on apps like Gaia GPS to see what the coverage is for the carrier that you have the accuracy is not 100%. If you're kind of on the perimeter of an area, I wouldn't count on having it. It is a good idea to get used to being self-sufficient and out on your own and just with your own thoughts and not having that tech to rely on. Now that said, I really feel better about having a personal locator beacon. My mother, my therapist, they all feel better about me carrying a personal locator beacon. This allows me to communicate. It has an SOS button. I can get weather reports, um, it can track me, and so that gives my loved ones peace of mind, and it gives me peace of mind that if something happens, I have a backup plan. If you're afraid of not finding a place to camp, well, I have a whole video about looking for places to camp and in both the planning process and once you're out on the trail. This is something that I've experienced too. I have gone places where you don't necessarily get a permit and it's kind of like I really hope that the campsite that's there is available and um, it can definitely be a little bit scary to think about if it is occupied and you might need to ask someone like, hey, do you mind if I shack up with you guys tonight? I'll get, you know, try to give your space or what have you. Um, and hopefully they're cool people or what have you. Usually people on the trail, I've really had good experiences with people on the trail, but that's another topic we'll cover shortly. But most people understand if there is limited space. But before you go, look for the flat areas. Um, a topo map will help you to figure out some of the areas that are going to be more flat. And a lot of times there will be sites that are marked or planned um, or designated. If you're afraid that you're going to run out of food or water, it, well, if you're going for an overnight trip, you can carry everything you need for the whole trip on your back, no issue. For your food, plan on taking more than what you need. And yes, you're going to have to carry that weight, but it does take a little bit of experimentation to figure out what the right amount of food is for you. Plan out all your meals, plan your snacks, think about how much you're really going to need each day. I like to carry a ton of snacks. That's just how I am. But I also like the peace of mind of knowing that I have those snacks if I end up out there longer than I had planned and I'm not going to go hungry. With regards to running out of water, not knowing how to find water, plan on that ahead of your trip. Make sure that you're familiar with what the water sources are, how reliable they are, because certainly at different times of the year, there's going to be more plentiful water than others. And some websites have better information about this than others, but you can always call the ranger station to find out. 
generally lakes, established lakes, are pretty reliable. And maybe they're not the ideal water source, but they are a water source. And as long as you're taking your proper water filtration, which you should be practicing before you go out there, then you should be all right. Also, if you're going to be in an established campground, it will tell you if it's a dry campground or if it's not. And we take water in a jug um, for like dishwashing and that kind of thing. And then we take bottled water for drinking. And that works well for us when we are dry camping. But again, this isn't something that's for everyone. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to someone who's going for their first camping trip. But as you're getting more experience and kind of finding your way, it is something to open up to. If you're concerned that you won't know where to go or that you'll get lost, practice this ahead of time. Get familiar with how to navigate at some trails that are closer to home. Take an orienteering or land navigation course if you possibly can. I don't recommend relying solely on a GPS unit just because things can fail. I really recommend, if you possibly can, using a map and compass and having the knowledge to use those adequately. When you're figuring out where to go, choose well-marked trails that are well-established. And again, if you don't know your way around super well, you might want to go somewhere that is more populated so that you can ask for directions. When you get to wherever you're camping, be sure to explore the area so that you can get familiar and you're less likely to get turned around. Some people opt to stay where it's illegal for them to camp and so they're concerned about getting caught. And in some places, this is more common than others. Here in the United States, um, we have a lot more legal options than say the UK. The UK, a lot of places are technically illegal. So um, I, tend to stay in legal places, but again, I have that luxury. It's up to you how much risk you're willing to accept on this one. But if you do go, then look for somewhere that's not a wide open space. Look for something with some good tree cover. Don't set up until it gets closer to dark. Avoid building a fire and absolutely, as always, leave no trace. Try to be as covert as possible about it and try to have gear like your tent and such or your hammock, whatever you're using, that's in more muted tones. If you're afraid of being uncomfortable, well, dial in that sleep system while you're at home still. Try it out on the floor of your bedroom and you can use a pillow. I even have an inflatable body pillow that I like. I got this really inexpensive body pillow thing on Amazon. I inflate it most of the way and then I put it inside of a king size pillowcase so that it does, like the ends of it don't scratch me and I have gotten way better sleep since I started using this. So there are workarounds for what comforts of home will help you to sleep better when you're out in a campground or backpacking, but experiment and see what works for you. And certainly if you're car camping, you have more options available to you than you do if you're out in the wilderness, but there are different like sleep systems, you know, as far as, you know, sleeping pads and air beds and foam pads and cots and all these different things. And then there's sleeping bags and quilts, and which there are backpacking quilts and then like the kind of quilts that like your grandmother made. Um, but you can try different things and see what is comfortable for you. Some people, their game is pretty up here. <laughs> um, I'm impressed with some of the setups that some people have for camping. I am a much more primitive style camper, even when I'm car camping. But there are some people, if you go onto some groups on Facebook and such, People have got some pretty awesome setups that look like home, like they put rugs and like all kinds of stuff. And so check those out and get into some camping groups because, again, you'll get so many ideas that will help keep you comfortable. Part of being comfortable is also staying warm. And so if you're afraid that you might get cold, pay attention to the conditions as it's getting closer to your trip. Weather reports, whether it's a town weather report or a mountain weather report or what have you, there are weather reports for where Wherever you're headed. Make sure that you're planning your gear accordingly. So for example, having an insulated sleeping pad, um, taking, you know, a puffy coat and a hat that's warm and gloves, and you can even take booties to sleep in. 
and make sure that you're you have nice warm clothing and that you have changes of clothing so that if you get sweaty that you can change out of those versus getting cold it's okay to plan for gear that is warmer than what you expect but again you want to avoid sweating make sure that your bedding whether it's sleeping bag a quilt what have you is rated for a temperature that's significantly lower than the temperatures that you expect to be in so for example if you have a 30 degree sleeping bag I wouldn't take that in temperatures much below about 50 degrees most companies are not rated for comfort they're rated for survival if you're concerned about being out of shape then train for your trip a bit and start slow start where you are if you are literally coming up off the couch walk around the block and then start adding your backpack empty and then slowly progressing with more weight with it and you one of the things that I like to do when I'm training for a trip with my pack on is I'll take my bear canister, which I know not everybody has a bear canister, but do some kind of like, you know, your food sack or something and fill it up with like canned foods because those are super heavy. Please don't use them as backpacking food, but put them in your bear canister, your sack, what have you, and you can weigh down your pack that way really easily. But you also can plan your trip so that it's not, you don't have to go turbo. It doesn't have to be 10 mile days right out the gate with, you know, 5,000 feet of elevation gain. You can go a mile on an easy trail, go set up camp for the night, and then hike out the next day. It all counts. What matters is just getting out there. Nobody's going to judge you because you didn't go far enough or you didn't go long enough. A one night trip is still a backpacking trip. I've done tons of one night trips because sometimes that's what works and I can't get Friday off of work or Monday off of work or whatever. So you just do what you can. And some of the coolest places I've been have actually been pretty easy trails and they don't have to be far from home either. So if you, somehow you find that you are in over your head and you need to get back to your car and just go home, that's okay. Try again another time though. Please, 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 please try again if the first time is not successful. If you're concerned that your car might get broken into or stolen at the trailhead, I've had this concern. This is more common at some trailheads than others, and usually that information will be available in comments or reviews online. And don't leave anything in your car that's visible, that's of any kind of value. I don't even leave my wallet hidden in my car because I don't want it to get stolen if somehow my car does get broken into. I take with me, I have two credit cards, my ID and like $20 in cash and that all goes in my backpack with me and that's what I have for from the time I leave home till the time I get back home. I leave maybe a Red Bull but not in bear country and clothes in my car while I'm backpacking because I like to change clothes when I get back. Carry your keys with you rather than leaving them like magnetized under your wheel well or what have you because people do know to check that kind of stuff. And I personally just would feel better having my keys with me and not leaving them for some person who's up, some person who's an opportunist. And again, in bear country, you want to get all smellables out of your car. If you have chapstick or hand sanitizer or sunscreen or ketchup packets or a gum wrapper, get them out of your car before you go. Otherwise, depending on where you are, it will look like someone broke into your car, but that was a local resident. If you're worried about getting injured on the trail, there are several things here. First, avoid any unnecessary risks. I have avoided certain things, looked up and down a water crossing area to try to find the safest place to cross. I have avoided landslides and different things like that. If you're worried about like natural disasters, avalanches, fires, um, you know, landslides, those kinds of things, there are usually warnings that those are going to happen. And not always necessarily, but generally there are. And they're all very rare to happen right where you are. So that's something to think about. But, you know, if you know that the fire danger is high, you want to stay on alert. And if you smell smoke or you see smoke somewhere, then that's where having a personal locator beacon can be super helpful because you can reach out to search and rescue. You can press that SOS button 
and ask how to get out safely. This goes back to knowing your exits before you go out there and do your research right before that trip to know your fire risks, your avalanche risks, what have you. Not doing that, frankly, is irresponsible and you're putting yourself and search and rescue at danger by not doing that homework ahead of time. So with that, be sure to carry something like a personal locator beacon and of course carry a first aid kit. I have a video about my first aid kit down in the description below. I am a registered nurse and so I talk about what I carry in mine and Really, the things that I carry in mine are the same things that anyone should carry. I don't have anything especially super nursey in mine that's, you know, a baby some quick clot. That's about it. But um, the most commonly used things in my first aid kit are going to be your Band-Aids, Leukotape, um, Tums, and uh, let me see, what else did I have? and anti-chafe. Maybe some antibiotic ointment, but that's unusual for me to even bother with it. If you're worried about getting bitten by a tick, um, then, and again, I have a video, I'll put it down in the description. I have a couple of videos. Um, I have one about um, sprays and that kind of thing, and then another one about treating your gear and your clothing with permethrin. But using those items can certainly be helpful, and avoid going into tall grasses. Always carry a tick key with you, just in case, because things do do happen and if you do get bitten be sure to remove it right away the less time that a tick is attached to you the better a tick has to be attached for at least 24 hours in order for you to get lime but there are other things that you can get with a shorter period a tick that's still crawling on you is not going to get you sick necessarily but of course get rid of it. If you do get bitten, contact your primary care provider as soon as possible. If you're concerned about mountain lions, be aware that it's extremely rare to see them. I've never seen one in all of my years on the trail, but I have heard one before at night and it was actually really cool to hear. I just heard a mountain lion for the first time. That was pretty cool. It didn't sound super close. <laughs> but it uh, probably sounded pretty close to the people on the other side of the campground uh, where it was a lot closer to them. Sounded very much like the video that I've got down in the description. If you do see one, stand up tall, don't run, and do not approach, especially if it has kittens, if it's eating something. Give it space to escape. If it acts aggressively or moves toward you, Act, get as big as possible, slowly wave your arms, pull out the sides of your jacket if you're wearing one, and use a loud, firm voice. If it's still not scared, then try to throw a rock or a stick at the ground in front of it, not at it. And yes, this is easier said than done without bending over because you don't want to bend over, crouch, squat, etc. But if, you know, you're on a slant and there's rocks or sticks on the side, try to grab those. Um, you can also, if you have anything on you, you know, throw those toward it, that kind of thing. The idea is to teach the mountain lion that you are not prey and that you might be a threat. If it's still coming toward you, start aiming for its body, not at its head. But try to hold on to, if you have like a water bottle or something that's kind of heavy with you, try to keep that with you in case you do need to beat it off or you need to um, put it inside of like a backpack to swing or a fanny pack, whatever you have. If you are attacked, again, extremely rare, stay standing as best you can and face the lion. Fight back. It's probably going to go for the head and the neck, so just be aware of that. And if you have a backpack on, try to use it as a shield. A lot of people are scared of bears, and polar bears are about the only bears that are going to come after you aggressively. Even grizzly bears are not necessarily aggressive. Most bears are like a two-year-old and a raccoon, but a big, and they just want your food. They really are not that interested in us. And unless you're in Yosemite or Tahoe, they're pretty easily spooked. If it's allowed, you can carry bear spray, but be sure to know how to use it properly. If you see a bear, make yourself look as large as possible. Avoid eye contact, wave your arms slowly, avoid crouching, squatting, bending over. Do not run because this will trigger its prey drive. If the bear is stationary, try to get around it sideways so that you can keep an eye on the bear but also not trip over anything. Do anything that you can to keep that bear from getting access to your food. 
don't climb a tree because bears are really good climbers, especially black bears, and they will follow you. Be sure to give the bear an escape route. And if that bear charges at you, stand your ground. I know that's counterintuitive, but stand your ground because most of the time it is a bluff. And what that means is it will charge at you and then go to the side. And even if you're tried, you can't outrun a bear. With a grizzly bear, keep your voice deep, calm, and low. If you are attacked, you need to play dead and try to get on your stomach or in a ball and stay as quiet as possible during the attack. Make sure that the bear has left the area before you move. If it's a black bear, then you're going to want to get loud, yell, bang pots and pans. If it attacks you, then you're going to want to fight back and aim for the face and the muzzle. If you're concerned about coyotes, it is extremely rare for them to be problematic to humans. We're much bigger than they are, so there's that. More people are killed by errant golf balls and champagne corks than have been bitten by coyotes. In the U.S. and Canada, according to the Humane Society, there are two known situations where somebody has died because of a coyote, ever. I have seen countless coyotes out um, near where I live, out in Yosemite, out in different places, and I've never had one get aggressive with me, even if they're in a pack. And I've even seen their eyes in the bushes with my headlamp during an early morning hike, and yeah, that's a little terrifying. <laughs> if one is not going away, then do not run, but get big and get loud. And you can bang pots and pans, use a whistle, um, throw rocks or sticks at it if you have to. You may have to walk toward it while intensifying your behavior if it's habituated to people. If you're concerned about snakes, out on the trail or in your camp, then I have a whole video up here about um, what to do if you do see a snake and if you're bitten and all of that. But there are only three types of venomous snakes in the United States and none of them are aggressive. If you do see one, give it a wide berth. Try to let it go by on its own. Don't try to move it or pick it up because that's how most people that do get bitten get bitten and you can still get tetanus from a bite even if it's not necessarily a poisonous bite, even if it's dead or a decapitated head. If there's one that's blocking your path, you're going to have to wait it out, give it space. You can stomp on the ground because that's how they hear. They don't have eyes that can see you or, well, they have eyes, but they can't really see you. And they don't have external ears, so that they don't hear you if you're yelling. So stomping the ground is really the best way to let them know that you are there. A really common fear is predatory people. And the odds of someone coming out, especially all the way out to the backcountry, that's seeking to harm someone are those are really exceedingly rare like it's so rare that when it happens it makes national news you can arm yourselves with things like pocket knife pepper spray pay attention to what the local laws are but it'll be more empowering to take a personal defense course a self-defense course because that's something that cannot be used against you unlike a knife or other weapons. Stay aware of your surroundings. Say hello to other campers and trail users. Be friendly and make it known that you are seeing them and that you're not an easy target. But statistically, you are more likely to get injured in a car accident than on the way to the trailhead than you are to get injured by someone or attacked by someone or assaulted by someone while out on the trail or even in an established campground. And this is where having rangers and a camp host can be really helpful. With regards to just being generally scared, it's normal to be scared with something new. And that's just how it is. And I still get anxious before a trip. And I still go. And I'm always grateful that I went. If you're going for more than one night, then take what you learned that first night, apply it the next night, and so forth. It will get easier as you get experience. After your trip, evaluate what went well and what could be improved for the next time. I'm going to leave links down below in the description to, I have a lot of videos that really go into a lot of these in depth and some other resources that I found along the way that could help you a lot. Be sure to follow me on Facebook, Instagram. I'm technically on TikTok, but just barely, but you can follow me on all of those. And of course, subscribe, like, share, all those good things. And let me know if you get out camping. I really hope that this video has helped you to overcome those fears a bit enough to get out there. And I want to hear about it if you do get out there. Thank you so much for watching. Bye. My personal locator beacon. Eh. <laughs> that was the plan.
Just don't dump it in your view. I'd like to get into, oh, I don't know. Let's scratch that last bit. Throw pots and, or, yeah, throw pots and pans in it. You can do that too.